Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Rich Longo, and I'll be your host for today's presentation. Thank you for joining us for another Flycast Partners webinar. Today's webinar, we ask you, are you in control of your workload automation? Presented by Joey Rubishaw. Joey is a software consultant at BMC Software and has been in the IT industry for almost four decades, which is quite some time in this industry. He has worked extensively in pre- and post-sales implementations, mainly with Fortune 1000 clients. Joey has focused on corporate enterprise application implementations, workload automation, application lifecycle management, testing and monitoring, including end user experience, quality assurance, server monitoring, network monitoring, load and functional testing, Java application performance, and requirements and change management, testing management, triage, and troubleshooting. And I'm sure there's a ton more out there that he's been involved in been or certified in. Before we get started, Joey, let me introduce our organization. Flycast Partners is here to deliver a seriously amazing IT experience. Founded and staffed by personnel that have many years of experience in the IT space, <clears throat> we took the best ideas from these collective experiences and added the best components necessary to grow and become a leading value-added reseller in the North American IT market. We offer best-in-class implementation services and training in ITSM, ITAM, workload automation, capacity optimization, enterprise service management, all using ITO best practice. Our professional services can easily scale up or down to meet the IT needs of any customer, regardless of your size, complexity, or budgetary restrictions. We offer implementation services both on-site and remote, as well as training to help reinforce your company's long-term IT success. Our ongoing remote administration and support service offerings will enable your organization to focus on those normal day-to-day -day operations, saving you both precious time and money. We encourage you to visit our website if you haven't already at www.flycastpartners.com or feel free to reach out to us directly at 844-FLYCAST. That's 844-359-2278. And this is just one of many weekly webinars that we host here at Flycast Partners. So I encourage you to take a gander at our Flycast Partners webinar page and sign up for a topic that interests you. Next month and in, in, uh, the uh, next month and the month following are going to be more ITIL focused webinars where we address service design, service transitions, service operations. We'll talk about best practices for service management software in 2017. Some great topics coming up. So I encourage you to sign up, invite your coworkers or friends, send them a link and uh, get them signed up for next month's presentation. Presentations. At the end of today's webinar, we will be taking your questions live. Joey will try to answer as many as he can during this 45-minute presentation we have allocated today. I encourage you to take advantage of his time, and if we can't get those questions in today, go ahead and email us at info, info at flycastpartners.com. That's info at flycastpartners.com, and we'll get those answers for you directly in five business days. You can also utilize our website to do further research on the topic, even check into additional training that is available, even in ITIL or other IT tools, assistance with professional services, or our IT Solution Finder. With that being said, I'm going to go ahead and turn this over to none other than Joey. And welcome, everybody. I'm, I'm grateful for your attendance here. And I've got a little slideshow that we're going to pop through. We'll go ahead and start from the beginning here. And we're going to talk about... As he's getting uh, set up, please, when he goes through the slide deck, go ahead and put your questions in. And once he gets done with the slide deck and go, goes into uh, showing some other stuff, maybe we can take some questions then. So use the Q&A section of this webinar to ask your questions, please. Yes, please do. So we're going to talk about BMC's Control M product today. And we used to call this workload automation. And BMC has been getting heavily into di digital enterprise management. And as a result of that, we decided to rebrand Control-M from workload automation to digital business automation. Still does the same stuff, but uh, it, it kind of fits into the overall scheme a little differently. And so I just want to start, start off thinking about what an enterprise looks like with traditional job scheduling, okay? 
typically you have a lot of different stakeholders. You've got administrators and operators and developers and so on like that. They may be using a lot of different tools, um, e either you know uh, things like Cron or Windows Task Scheduler. If you're using uh, uh, applications, they may have their own specific tools. Uh, you may be doing file transfers. You may be fooling with different types of applications. This is all great, but what happens is that typically two of these groups are, aren't listened to. They don't, they don't get to play. Developers and business users don't get to play in typical job scheduling. It's the other guys who are involved. And when they do, they tend to use the tools that, they, that they're associated with. So if they fool mainly with ERP uh, products, they're going to use ERP tools. If they're admins, uh, they probably use cron or task schedule. So, so you end up having a mismatch of different sc job scheduling tools used by different people. Nobody really sees the big picture. There are a lot of different skills involved, and it's very difficult, extremely difficult, to integrate these two things together in these tools into one view. Furthermore, it's, it's almost impossible to look and say, well, what's happening right now? Okay, Because you have to look at it in a lot of different, different places to find that information. What Control-M does with digital business automation is we check, kind of change the picture. First off, everybody gets to play. We have one tool that everyone can use. It gives you an enterprise-wide view of everything that's happening on your, on your system. So because of that, it's very easy to do service level management. Uh, we can work with a particular type of applications you have, whether they're big data or ERPs or database or uh, file transfers, whatever that might be. One tool can handle that across all of your different platforms. You know, whether you're running Windows or Unix or Linux or AS400 or, you know, what have you. Uh, we can talk to all of those things. We also make it very easy to monitor what's going on across all of these disparate systems. Okay, so we're going to give you a dashboard where you can look and very easily see what's going on right now, what has happened today. Since we're watching what's going on, that means we, we watch what happened yesterday. We watch what happened the day before. So we know what your history looks like. Uh, it makes it very handy for debugging things. When somebody wants to know, well, gee, what happened last Thursday? Roll the clock back to last Thursday, and you'll see exactly what was going on. But the really neat thing about the history is that we're watching your jobs perform. So we know how they normally perform. We know what normal performance is. With that information, we can do some forecasting. You can say things like, well, you know, what if I change this, and what if I change this? But if everything else remains normal, what's going to happen to my deadlines? Am I going to meet my service levels or not? We can, we can tell you that so that you don't have to find, that, find out the hard way. Okay. We give you a, a, a GUI-based tool to make it very easy. It's a drag-and-drop type thing to define your different workflows. And we're going to see that there's, there's also even other ways to accomplish that. But uh, the whole idea is that Control-M is very easy to use. We also give you an administration level tool that lets you handle your entire uh, uh, workload enterprise infrastructure. So we, for example, we make it easy to push out upgrades and, and, and fix packs and things like that to your various uh, agents, agent stations that are involved in your workflow. We can even push out the GUI to people who are involved in, in fooling with GUI. Make it, makes it very easy to define uh, the particular authentication schemes and, and the, the various ways you may communicate with your different uh, applications. We have one central place where all of that is controlled. And finally, you know, the people who need this information may not want to have this GUI. You have users. Uh, you may have customers. Um, they don't want to install a GUI, but they still want the information. So right now they're calling into your operators. They're calling into your, your uh, uh, applications people. That takes time, and that's confusing for them. We give you self-service. Okay, self-service is a browser-based tool where with proper authentication, users can come in. Users can come in and see what's happening. So it's just like they're looking at the GUI. Furthermore, you, you don't have to do it just with a browser. You can load it. We have apps for uh, for Apple and Android devices, where from a cell phone or from a tablet, people can get to the same information no matter where they happen to be, no matter when they happen to be. And by the way, this is a two-way street. They not only can see what's happening, but depending on their permissions, their defined permissions, they may be able to interact with what's happening. So like maybe uh, start jobs or schedule jobs or kill jobs or hold, put jobs on hold, things that they might ordinarily have to uh, call an operator to do. Now, one of the things we found is that in developing workflows, th there are typically different p sets of people involved. You have business users who understand what they need to, you know, what, how the workflow needs to be set up. 
We may have developers or schedulers who are actually creating those workflows. Uh, and then we have operators who have to use those workflows. The problem we found was that everybody speaks different languages when, when they're involved in this process. Furthermore, it, it tends to be a very wordy process where people may write specs on a form or maybe in, an, in a Word document or a spreadsheet or something like that. When people write things down, someone has to read them and understand exactly what, what they meant. And that's not all, always that easy to do. And this, what happens is your typical IT iterative process where somebody does something, somebody else looks at it and says, well, no, that's not quite right. Uh, and then you just go back and forth and back and forth. Yeah, I know that's what I said, but that's not what I meant type stuff. It's a very slow process and a very frustrating process. And if you're in, in IT, everybody's seen this. Everybody's come across this. What we've done is come up with something called Workload Change Manager. Workload Change Manager actually gives the same workflow development tools to the end users. Okay, so if you have savvy end users, they can use the same tool to define, develop their own workflows. Now, they can, they can uh, develop the workflows. They can't run the workflows. They can't schedule the workflows, but they can define them. That then gets passed to developers, to more technical people who can sanity check it, make sure that everything is set up the proper way, and then move the, it can then get pro promoted on into production or develop or test or what, ha what have you, whatever's appropriate in your, uh, your enterprise. Now, since everybody's speaking the same language, it goes much faster. Uh, we can enforce site standards um, in, in various rules that, that can be applied, which, which improves the overall quality of the end product. Uh, we found that when we first introduced Workload Change Manager, people who were taking, oh, several weeks from the time that a workflow was initially proposed to the time that it was finally accepted, uh, now could cut that down to maybe a couple of hours. So it lets you very quickly react. And, and in this, today's business, we do need to quickly react to changing conditions. So Workload Change Manager has been very, very popular with folks. Now, just thinking a little bit about workflows in general. Typically, you have things like that. You have different people involved in creating workflows. If you ask anybody what's happening at any particular time, nobody really knows. It's very difficult to collect this information. But if you wanted to ask what's running this right now that's important, that, that's almost impossible to define. Okay? And to me, important are jobs that mean whether or not you're going to meet your service levels, whether or not you're going to meet your deadlines. Okay? What Control-M does for you is a couple of things. We're going to give you a very easy way to define your workflows, to, to plot them out, to display them and monitor them in, in a meaningful format, uh, and give you the information about what's happening in the jobs. We can query the individual jobs, see what they're doing, see what's happening. We can create dependencies, and this, this is really neat in Control-M. You quite often have job B needs to run after job A. If you're using something like Cron or Task Scheduler, the only way you can really do that is by, by assigning times to them. Well, I'll run this one at 6 o'clock, and it shouldn't take more than 20 minutes, so I'll run the next one at 6.30. That ought to give me some, some time. Well, at best, it means that you're wasting 10 minutes sitting there doing nothing. Uh, at worst, it means that, oh, guess what? It took 31 minutes to run this time, which means now we're, we're overlapping the second job and things start to fail. When you're using dependencies, you can say, hey, as soon as the preceding job finishes, go ahead and kick off the next job. So... The other neat thing about dependencies in Control-M is that they can be cross-platform dependencies. So we may have a Unix job that's waiting on a Windows job, that's waiting on an AS400 job, that's waiting on a, you know, a Hadoop job from somewhere. So we can mix the uh, applications, we can mix and match uh, uh, platforms, uh, we can mix and match operating systems. We really don't care. To, to BMC's Control-M, they're just jobs, and it's very easy to show the dependencies by just drawing arrows in between them. Okay. Now, oops, let me hit the right thing here. What we want to be able to do, we have a, a number of jobs defined. Not all of them are as important as other jobs. So here we have a, a little workflow right here, and it has to finish by 6.30 in the morning. We're going to send an ADP file for a, for a, a payroll. If, it, if that doesn't happen by 6.30 in the morning, people are going to get very, very upset. So what happens when we're, when we're running this workflow? Okay, this payroll must complete by 6.30. And we have critical jobs. We have something called Batch Impact Manager. In Batch Impact Manager in Control-M, you point to your critical job. Control-M will then plot the backflow to determine the critical path that must complete in a timely manner in order to meet our deadline. If we look at this, you see that we put little blue stars on some of these jobs. These are the critical path. 
Things like this data X report doesn't have one. Print EXP file doesn't have one. Exception report doesn't have one. Post exception doesn't have one. They're not in the critical path, which means if they have issues, we really don't care that much. We can deal with it later because we're concerned about getting this the, the main thing done by 6.30 in the morning. So as you're running, as you're processing through this, Control M's watching all this. We watch the workflow. We watch the job flow. Oh, we have a failure. Well, that's nice. We'll deal with it later because it doesn't affect our, our deadline. Okay. But we might find that we've got another failure. We may have another issue. Here, the AMP loan stat just failed. It's critical to, to meeting our, 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 our completing our workflow efficiently, effectively. If this is, thing isn't, isn't uh, dealt with appropriately, we may not hit our deadline here. Now, the thing is, we discovered this at 2.30 in the morning. We didn't wait till 6.30 to tell you that, hey, you just missed your deadline. You know, and, and a lot of products will do that. And, you know, great, you didn't do me any favors. I don't need to know at 6.30. It's too late to do anything about it. Tell me as early as you can that I may have an issue. Now, this issue may be maybe a job that's running too long. How does it run, know that it's running too long? Well, it knows how it normally runs. It watches it every night. So Control M knows what the appropriate time is. If we see it exceeding that time, we can flag somebody early enough so that they have a chance to do something about it. Okay. So we're not going to tell you, oh, you missed your deadline, because you have it. It's only 2.30 in the morning. You still got four hours to, before you miss the deadline. But we will tell you that you are in danger of perhaps missing your deadline unless somebody takes a look at this. Okay. So we can alert you in various ways. We can we can uh, uh, create logs on a report. We can put alerts on a uh, uh, an alert desk. Uh, we can create trouble tickets. We can send emails. We can do whatever is appropriate to notify the appropriate people uh, that there is an issue in a timely manner so that people can, can get involved in uh, resolving this issue in, in, in order to not miss our, our service level. Okay. Something else we've added to uh, Control M, the latest version, version 9, is manage file transfer. We've always done file transfers in Control M. Basically, you created a job, and it was a file transfer job, and it would transfer files. And that worked fine, and you could monitor your workflow fine. The problem was, it was we monitor workflow in a job-oriented manner. So if you knew which job your file transfer was in, it was very easy to find it. But a lot of people didn't know the job. They just knew the name of the file. So they'd say, well, where's my file? Is, has it arrived yet? And you, it, the information was there, but you had to dig a little bit to find it. Managed file transfer gives you a new dashboard that shows you things, your, your information from a file viewpoint. So it's very, very easy to look at, at uh, uh, file names or search for particular files, see the status, uh, be alerted if there are issues, uh, and the type of information that you need to, in order to, uh, to manage your entire file transfer uh, procedures. It's all in your enterprise view, whatever type of file transfers you're doing. Uh, we can uh, transfer not only from your own machines, but if you're, you're receiving files from customers or shipping files to customers or, or uh, maybe suppliers, uh, we, can, we can transfer back and forth between those machines as well. Something else uh, that you have within Control M, and, and cloud computing is, is so important to everybody right now. And by the way, uh, if you go to Amazon Cloud, the Amazon Cloud Marketplace, uh, we are the only uh, digi uh, workload automation tool that's, uh, that's out there. You can actually uh, uh, spin up a version of Control M out there and run Control M totally from the cloud, uh, not on your own machines at all if you wanted to. But suppose you're using cloud for, for workstations. I'm, I need machines to do work. Okay. If you're not doing cloud, something that this might happen. We're going to run some jobs, and they're running on some of your machines. We'll schedule some more jobs. They're running in some more of your machines. Schedule more jobs. Load up your machines a little bit more. Schedule more. And now we're using our, our resource pretty much full out, full bore. Time to schedule another job. Well, there's no place to go for it to go because we used up all of our resources. Okay. With control for cloud, that's not an issue. We can we can monitor this. We can see that there are, are inadequate resources available. So we'll just we can just spin up a virtual image somewhere and go ahead and run that, uh, that the particular workflows from that virtual image. Uh, if there are any modifications necessary to those uh, workflows in order to do that, we'll do that automatically for you. Self-service, we had mentioned earlier. Uh, this is a tool that uh, users or customers or, or you know, even your, your internal users uh, and stakeholders can get to the Control M information without having to use our GUI. They can, they can get to it from a browser on their own machines. They can load it up on their iPhones or iPads. Uh, or Android devices as well. It's very easy to use. 
it allows a service catalog, which means that, that business users can manage their own information. And let me, let me tell you what that means. Quite often when you're running a workflow, you get to a point where a sanity check is required. So everything stops until a user get, looks at a report or checks some, some balances or something and then says, okay, it's, it's okay to continue now. And he has to call an operator and say, okay, it's, it's okay to, to, to can you continue on. Well, he can actually do that from self-service now. So the user can look, look at the information. Well, you can look at the jobs from self-service. You can look at the output from the jobs from self-service. If that user determines that, hey, everything looks pretty satisfactory, he can again go ahead and say, I confirm that it is okay to continue on. By the way, all of this information can be kept uh, in, in an audit report, so you always know what happened to what jobs by what user. Uh, this may be from self-service. It could be from the GUI and operators as well. So you do have full audit and annotation capability, which is completely configured uh, available to you at all times. A lot of times a user may look at a report and say, geez, based on the, the values I'm seeing here, I really realize that I need to run another workflow before I can continue. Well, instead of having to call an operator and say, hey, I need you to run these jobs, in the service catalog, we'll have a list of jobs that that user is permitted to schedule by himself. He can go ahead and schedule those jobs. If they require parameters, uh, he can input the parameters at the time, schedule the job, watch them run, look at the output, decide whether or not it's appropriate to continue or not. So again, he can do this from anywhere, you know, whether it's a, he's sitting at his desk or she's out at the ball game, uh, you know, with, by using their mobile devices, iPads, Androids, uh, iPhones. Okay, big data. Um, control, we've been doing big data processing for about three, three and a half years now. Um, and and a, big data is, is something that most of, of us are familiar with. And I can pretty much guarantee you that if you do not have a big data initiative right now going on, somebody in your organization, probably someone a little higher up in your organization, is thinking about it. I was reading a book the other day uh, talking about the music industry. And they were saying that record companies, and I think it's funny that we still call them record companies, even though they rarely produce records anymore. Basically, the only information they ever had before was what records were they selling, what what areas were they selling in, and what was the, the radio plays? How many times did people listen to, to songs on the radio? That's what they had to base all, all of their decisions on. Well, nowadays, it's a lot different. People don't buy records anymore. They may, they may use streaming services. Uh, they may use YouTube or Spotify or something like that. They may talk to other uh, uh, friends or users or what have you through Facebook or, or forums. Gee, this is a good band. This is a, a nice song. You ought to listen to it. So all of this stuff could greatly increase the, the play of various songs, and the record companies had no idea what was going on. Okay? Uh, I saw an instance where uh, a particular band was doing fantastic in Spain, but the record companies didn't know a thing about it because of the, the, it was all coming through uh, uh, streaming services and, and uh, uh, social, social uh, media. Record companies can now collect that information. Basically, the, the, the various sources sell it to the record companies. Okay, so this is a massive amount of data to, to watch everything that's happening on YouTube, to watch everything that's happening on Spotify, to scan Twitter and, and Facebook to see what, what bands and what songs people are talking about. And this changes minute by minute, second by second. So it's a, it's a constant flow of information that all goes back to the record companies. They get this information, and now they can make you know, just, just spot on at the, at the particular time that they need to make it, make accurate decisions about what they need to do. This is massive amounts of data that they need to handle, and that's what big data and Hadoop processing does for you. It accepts that type of information and uh, uh, lets you work with it. Now, what a lot of people don't realize is that Hadoop processing is basically batch processing. It's all done in batch. Okay, we're collecting information from different sources. We're running batch programs against it to uh, to collate and, and manipulate that information to make it available to the people in the manner the manner that they need it. Another idea to to give you an example of, of the scale of information we're talking about. Um, looking down here on the right hand side, the amount of terabytes that are are created in a year just based on, on cross-country flights, okay? That's a massive amount of data, but, but people need to use that information. Uh, and again, that's, that's what Hadoop processing and big data will do for you. In Control-M, we were the first workload automation tool 
to support uh, Hadoop. We're now partners. We are partners with all of the major uh, Hadoop players. Um, and the particular type of things that you need to do in Hadoop, we schedule them just like any other type of job. That also means we can integrate with other types of, of applications. Hadoop processing is, is rarely just Hadoop processing. You may have some file transfers. You may have some screen scraping. You may have some uh, data that you're receiving from the sources that you're buying data from. That needs to pull, get pulled in. That needs to be manipulated. You may run some type of a, a, a integration against that, some interpretation against that. Then it goes to Hadoop, which manipulates it, lets you run, run uh, queries against it. And then it gets pulled up, pushed out to databases and other uh, information sources that people can then access from online uh, uh, services and online uh, uh, applications. So Hadoop is just part of what's going on in that overall thing. With Control-M, we don't care what the application is. We can mix and match all of these applications in one workflow. So it's very easy to, to mix your Hadoop, necessary Hadoop processing in with the required non-Hadoop processing. All the major Hadoop job types, and, and, uh, uh, and by the way, these are constantly changing. And as they change, we support them as they come up. Uh, you can do all of that from within Control-M. Now, thinking about the applications as, as they're changing, I'd love to tell you that, you know, out of the box, Control-M supports every third-party application there is in the world. And I just can't do that because that, that's constantly changing. There is a, a, a limitless, it seems, uh, number of third-party applications. But what I can tell you is that if you do have a third-party application, maybe even a custom application that you've written yourself, written in-house, you more than likely can incorporate that within Control-M. We include an application integration tool with Control M. It's part of the product. You've already paid for it. You get it automatically. Where if there is an API into uh, an application, either through a command line or through a web service, you can very, very easily create a Control M job type to let you use that particular application within Control M. Furthermore, we make it easy to see what other people have done. On our uh, website, in our, in our uh, bmc.com website, we have a Control M application hub, user hub where we encourage users to upload custom applications that they've, uh, and job types that they've created. Uh, more than likely, if you, if you want to create a particular job type, go and check our hub for, uh, first because somebody, somebody may have already done that. And if they haven't done it, they may have done something very close to it. You can download that information, look at it, modify as necessary, and uh, continue on. Now, I want to say that, that this is something new in Control-M. It's really not. The idea of creating custom job types has existed for a long time, but it was never very easy to do. Uh, it was just a little cumbersome the way we had it set up. So one thing about BMC, if, if we have a product that's not easy to use, we pull it, we yank it, okay? And, and we, you know, our customers will tell us, we don't like using this, it's too difficult, it's gone, okay? And we replace it. We replace it with something that's easy to use, and it's not, not something that we think is easy to use, it's something that our customers, after they see it, say, wow, we can use that. It's pretty easy. Then we, we, we'll go ahead and release it at that point. Application integrator is incredibly easy to use. Uh, it, it's unusual to take more than a few minutes to create an application, or at least I have taken more than a few minutes to create an, an application before. So it's easy to do, quick and easy, and once you've done that, that job appears in Control-M just like it's any other type of Control-M job, and you can incorporate it from within your, in, in your workflows. Now, something else we've added, when you're running jobs, they create data, okay? They have uh, sysout that they create. They have output that they create. They have log files that they create. That can get pretty sizey. Uh, you may have just hundreds or, or, or thousands of gigabytes of information that's getting generated. Uh, some of this information you have to keep for a long time, uh, particularly if audit and compliance is an issue, uh, like uh, patient records or student records or payroll records. You may have to keep some of these things for quite a long time. Others you don't need to keep quite as long. Uh, what we have in control is something we call uh, workload archiving. Workload archiving lets you determine by the job type, by the workflow type, by the application type, how long you want to keep the information. And basically how long you want to keep it depends on how much storage you have. Uh, you may keep uh, you know, patient records for seven years and payroll records for five years and uh, certain audit records for you know, 10 years or something like that. Other things don't keep quite as long. Control-M will take basically all of the ASCII output from your jobs with workload, uh, with workload archiving and store that off in its own separate database. 
Now, when you go to look at that information, we'll do the joins for you so that it looks like you're looking at your standard database, but actually the, the text information is coming from somewhere else. Okay, so we're within the GUI, and we say, you know what, I need to, to see some historic information, and I'm going to go ahead and look at that historic information. Now, thinking about that, that's a nice idea, but there's one part that's missing. If, if you called me up and said, hey, I need the last 10 years of data on payroll records, and I came in with several dollies with boxes full of reports and dumped them on your desk and said, well, here you go. Well, that's accurate. That's correct. But I haven't done you any favors. Okay. Somewhere in those stacks of information is the information you need. Finding it is another story. With workload archiving, we, we provide complete archive search capability. So you, if you have an idea of you know, uh, a date range or uh, the type of thing you're looking for or even words or phrases, phrases within those uh, uh, files that you need to look for. We can let you define that and we'll show you, show you all of the different records that match that. You can compare those records and look at differences. Um, uh, for example, suppose uh, you, you start incurring a certain error and somebody says, well, you know what, uh, last summer, about three years ago, we, we had a similar error uh, uh, occurring. Well, okay, we'll just search on those particular word phrases, you know, Oracle error or whatever it might be, and we'll pop up and show you where all of that occurred at. Okay. And again, you can look at log information. You can look at the standard output information uh, that, that comes in there. You, by the way, you can do this either from the GUI or from self-service. So no matter where you happen to be, you can get to this information if you need to get to it. Now, one interesting thing, thing about the workload automation uh, marketplace is that it's growing. People are, are, are turning more and more to workload automation to handle their particular requirements um, because their business is growing. Uh, uh, IT is growing. It's growing about 7% a year, okay, for overall marketplace. Control-M's share of that market is growing about 15% a year, about twice what the overall market is growing. Well, that means we're taking uh, market share from other, other, custom, other uh, applications from our competitors. So we have a unique uh, uh, challenge that most of our competitors don't face. We have people converting from, a, from another tool to Control-M about every other day. Okay, so it, it, it happens a lot, and we have a requirement that we need to be able to convert from Autosys to Control-M. We need to convert from uh, uh, Unisetter to Autosys, whatever that might be, to, to Control-M rather, whatever that might be. So we, we uh, supply a free conversion tool, depending on what your, the uh, uh, prior tool you were using. We'll take that information, we'll convert it into Control-M job to, uh, workflow definitions. Now. I'd like to say it's going to get you 100% of the way there. Some of these uh, competing products do not contain all of the features from within Control-M. For example, Cron does not provide any way to do dependencies. Okay, So when you get to Control-M, you probably want to start using dependencies. But what we'll do is we'll get you about 80 or 90% of the way there. In many cases, we do get you 100% of the way there if we're coming from a full-fledged uh, workload automation uh, uh, competitor. Okay. We've used it a lot. We've had more than 2,000 people uh, uh, use this conversion tool. Uh, we've converted millions and millions of jobs. Uh, let's see. Things specific to, to Control-M. Well, we've got a lot of information on this. Uh, converting to Control-M, we can, we can give you value information about what happens when you convert to Control-M. Hadoop's uh, processing and upgrades. Let me talk, say one thing about upgrades. Um, with our administration tool, we can automatically handle uh, installing sick, pushing out and installing fix packs on your agent stations that, it, that you have Control-M installed on. Now, we have some people with thousands of, of agent stations. That is a major undertaking for them to try to uh, do all of those upgrades manually. With our new automation tool, you can specify which stations you want to go to. It will automatically handle, handle that for you. We can even push the client out, the GUI out, uh, to users that we want to have that users. Um, th that we want to have the, the GUI. When we do that, we can say things like, okay, go ahead and push the GUI out, uh, but if they haven't installed it by the end of the month, don't let them sign in again until they do install it. Uh, we can also say standard things like, you know, if, if the, if the uh, upgrade doesn't install completely, go ahead and back out the upgrade to the previous version. So these, we, we want to make the overall administration within Control-M easy to do. Um, along that same line, high availability is a very critical uh, functionality to, to most people. 
we want to have some type of failover. We want to have some type of a database replication. That always used to mean people would use some type of clustering or they'd buy some third-party product that, uh, that, that uh, provided high availability to them. You don't have to do that with Control-M. We include high availability within the product. You could just configure how you want the failover to, ha over to happen or the database replication to happen, and uh, it's, it's all built into the product. So you don't need to buy other tools in order to accomplish that functionality. And that is the end of my little uh, slideshow here. So I'm going to go ahead and quit the slideshow, bounce back to the uh, – While you're – Changing over to the tool itself, uh, Joey, we actually have a question that you might be able okay. to answer as you go in. Uh, Edwin wants to know, how does Control-M handle ag agent list scheduling? Okay, good, great question, great question. Because we do run across cases, a lot of situations where that does happen. Basically, what we do is we will use an agent to act as a proxy. And we'll tell that, tell that agent, okay, this is the agent list machine that we want to use. Now, as long as you can do either WMI or SSH, to that agent station, to that agentless station, we can do agentless against it. Once you've defined a station as an agentless station, it then appears in Control M just as if it were an agent. So, well, if you're using Control M, Control M GUI, I can't tell whether it's an agent or not. You know, whether it's agent or agentless based. So, and that's something we would handle through our uh, uh, administration tool in order to accomplish that. Okay. Do we have other questions? Yep. Uh, does the MFT allow you to use DMZ setup from tools like MoveIt uh, from Ipswich? I'm I'm not familiar with with GMZ setup. I know that we've done things with MoveIt before. Uh, can you can you share a little information about what that does? We'll wait for uh, them to type okay. in that and uh, go from there. They called it DMZ setup. So. Oh, DMZ setup. Sorry. So is that like I, I know we had one thing where uh, uh, if we want to pick up the files from a DMZ, from a DMZ, will it allow us to do it? That's what he's asking. Gotcha. Okay. As long as that DMZ has some sort of FTP server on it, we can accomplish that. Now I'll tell you one thing: we're we're, we're getting ready to add to the product. We had a situation where, and I think they were using MoveIt at the time, where Many different hundreds or thousands of different users may may sign want to sign in, uh, and instead of having to define all those users to control M, we would define they would be they pick be picked up from a table that would then say these are appropriate uh, users to come in, set a file on the DMZ, then control M would reach out and grab it from the DMZ. So, but basically, as long as, as there's authentication information to get to the particular machine, and if the machine can, can support FTP, uh, we, we, can, we can grab that file or send that file, whichever the case may be. Okay, and I just want to say thank you for that clarification. Oh, okay. Super, super. I hope that answered it. Uh, and by the way, if it didn't, if you still have others, just, you know, if you want to uh, email questions in, we'll, we'll be glad to get it. If I don't know the answer, I know the people who do know the answer. So uh, at, any, at any time, please do that. Are there any other questions, or I can go ahead and uh, jump really quickly into the product here? Not, not yet. Um, oh, wait a minute. Here's no. one. How about integration with Splunk? Oh, yeah. Uh, that's a good one. If you go out to our uh, – that was the first application that a user submitted uh, with Application Integrator. Uh, so they went ahead and built a Splunk integration. They submitted it to our uh, user group on our on our bmc.com, and uh, you can actually go out there and pull it down and, and uh, use it as. So we don't have Splunk built in automatically, but through Application Integrator, uh, there is uh, integ integration already built to do that. Okay, and uh, they said thanks, and we don't have anything just yet. So if you want to go into okay. it, there, Bobby. Okay. I'm sorry, Joey. I That's apologize. Okay. <laughs> I got, got looking at Bobby's name and, and talking to you. Sorry about that. That's quite all right. My last name is Robichaud, so I'm used to getting called all kind of different things, so it doesn't bother me a bit. So when you're in Control-M, this is the GUI, by the way. Uh, so this is something that not everybody's going to see. Your developers may see this. And by the way, I didn't know this because I used to be a developer. I understand the developers don't like to use GUIs anymore. They want to write code instead. So I'm going to be – develop a workflow here 
But everything that I'm doing, you can actually use JSON to, to describe the same thing in something that looks very much like code, and then uh, uh, have that convert, submit that to uh, Control M, and it'll actually create a job for you. Uh, we have something called Automation API that com accomplishes that. So let me go ahead and, and build a quick workflow. So I'm going to start with a blank workspace. Okay. So I've got a little blank workspace here, and I have job types. And let's see what we, and by the way, we might be able to see Splunk up here, because I know it used to be in there. No, I don't see it right now. So of these job types, everything that starts with a U was something that was done with application integrators. So like uh, U, MLA, U Azure, U Guidewire, so on like that. That's all cut. Oh, there's Splunk right there. Um, those are all things that were added through application integrator. Once I, you did that, they look just like any other job type. So I'm going to go ahead and grab a, a, a an, one that's included with the product. Let me grab an OS job type, which is just a, a batch file or a command on a machine. I'm going to drag and drop it into the workspace. And now I get to define what that is. Now, there are several levels of definition. I can give this, put a, a workflow within a folder and give the folder a name. Okay. And by doing that, I can then later on say things like show me everything within the payroll folder show me everything within the marketing folder things like that so it just makes it very easy to filter what's going on i can define a job name by the way if i am using uh site standards my job names have to follow certain criteria i don't think i'm using them right now so i can put whatever whatever wild things in here i want to i get to define what i want this os job to do so it can run a script it can run a command line or it can run an embedded script and what an embedded script is just a uh, it's a script that's not on a file system somewhere. It's kept within Control-M. Embedded scripts are nice when you want to run the same thing on a lot of different machines. So I can say whether I want this to run on one machine or a group of machines if necessary. Okay. Now, when I'm doing an embedded script, I have to tell it what type of script it is. So this is a batch file. What machines do I want to run? Here is a list of all the machines that, that Control-M knows about. These could be agents. They could be agentless. They could be groups. Windows agents, uh, containers, things like that. Um, and we have a number of machines. And I can't tell by looking at this which are agentless and which are not. So I'm just going to go ahead and run in the default one. By the way, if, if I have a new machine that Control Dem doesn't know about it, I can just type in the name right there. What user do I want to run as? Uh, quite often people use a, a system account or administration account uh, to run their jobs. I'm going to just go ahead and put in my ID right there. Okay. Now, Note how some of these, these fields are bounded in red. Anything that's in red is required, and this is configurable. You can require things or not. Uh, I need to give this an application type, so this may be payroll, and the sub-application may be hourly payroll. And again, this makes it easier for filtering. So I can say, show me all the payroll jobs, show me all the hourly payroll jobs, show me that's every, in everything in the name workflow. And there are a number of other different things I can put here. I'm just going to go ahead and skip all of that. Okay, when do you want to run it? Okay, well, I might want to run every day. I might want to run on certain days of the month or certain days of the week. Or maybe I want to look at a calendar and only run on certain days within a calendar. And so here are all the calendars that I may have defined. I'm going to go ahead and have this just run manually because if I don't, I'll forget about it and it'll get scheduled uh, uh, every day from now on. Um, when do you want it to run? You, is there a certain time frame in which it has to run? If so, we go ahead and take care of that right here. Uh, otherwise, it's going to run as soon as it, as it can. We can tell it to be cyclical, run over and over and over again, every five minutes, every 10 minutes, every three minutes, or at certain times of the day if we want. Okay. Now, at this point, I've done job scheduling. This is workload automation. What do you want to run after it finishes? What do you want to do after a job finishes? Because a job can finish a lot of different ways. It can fail. It can, do, we don't, it can end and we don't care if it failed or not. It can end successfully. Maybe it ended with a certain completion code. Maybe it's executed a certain number of time, day, times in a row or rerun a certain number of times in a row. Maybe it finished okay, but we don't see any output. Maybe it's failed a certain num number of times in a row. Or maybe the output contains some word or phrase that we want to key on. What do you want to do when that happens? Well, we can notify. And by the way, we can do combinations of these things, so we can do multiples. You might want to notify somebody. We might want to rerun the job. Say you're doing a file transfer and the file transfer fails. What's the most common thing you're going to do to try to resolve that? Hey, rerun the file transfer. 
instead of getting operators involved on phone calls, just go ahead and let it, let uh, control and take care of that automatically for you. So, uh, so there's a number of different things we can do here. This is where you really start saving yourself a lot of time when you start using uh, your conditions to take actions out of the operator's hands and, and doing those things automatically. Let me create a dependency real quick. I'm just going to do a cut and paste, put a second job in there, and I want to run this job after that one. Okay, I, that's my dependency. This may be a, a you know on a different machine on a different operating system. This may be a Windows job. This may be an AS400 job. Creating dependency simple. I just draw an arrow and, and it's done. Okay, at this point I could go ahead and test the job if I wanted to. Or if, you know, after testing, I can go ahead and save it as a job that I want to incorporate into my regular workflow. Now, this is something great out right here. It says promote the workspace. If you're using your, your Control M, BMC Control M license permits you to have multiple environments. So you might have a dev and a, and a prod and a, and a sandbox and a user acceptance testing and all of that. When you have to promote from one environment to the, to the, to the next, you quite often have to change your, your workflows a little bit. So your dev workflows may be all pointing to the dev databases. When I go to prod, I need to change that to point to the prod databases. Uh, you need to be very careful when you do that manually. Control M can do that automatically for you. You can define a set of rules and changes that you want to apply whenever something is promoted. Uh, this is all supported within Control uh, Workload Change Manager. So if, if, if I was happy with this, I could go ahead and promote it uh, to whatever level I wanted to. Once a job is in there and running, I can monitor it. I'll look at all the jobs that are running, and I, I know we're probably running pretty tight on time, so I'm going to uh, do this very quickly here. If I have it, let's, let's find a job that, uh, how many jobs do we have in here right now? Oh, it's not showing. I've got this at the bottom. Okay, so here's some that finished. Let's look at the, let's look at the output of these jobs. Okay, so this was just a sleep job, but I can see the output. I can see the approximate resources that it took. If there's a log in here, I can look at the log to see, okay, did I send emails? Did I do particular things? Did I send, uh, have a, a, you know, trouble tickets or, or change tickets created? If I wanted to look at the history, what happened on prior days? Okay, so I can look at, at prior days, what was happening. I can use my workload archiving to accomplish that as well. If I want to do uh, forecasting, okay, I want to forecast for a particular date in the future. Uh, I can forecast everything or I can only forecast things that meet certain filters if I want to. I do have a number of tools, things that just don't really fit into any place. So suppose I want to define a calendar. Here's where I could do that. If I want to, I want to create site standards or promotion rules, this is where I would do that. If we want to create reports, this is where we get to the reporting uh, uh, tool that we have. So the whole idea is that depending on which of these little icons on the left you select, this ribbon bar at the top changes. So we're only showing you the, the functionality that's appropriate to what you're trying to do right now. Keeps the product easy to use. By the way, we do have the training videos built into the product itself. So it's really easy to start uh, to get up to speed on Control M. And this, by the way, is how I learn Control M by going through the training videos. Uh, they're, they're pretty quick and pretty, pretty easy, and they show you what you need to know in order to use the product. So the whole idea is that we want to keep it easy. We want to keep it smooth um, so that you can get up to speed and start earning value from the product as quickly as possible. And if you have a competing product in there, use our conversion tool to get you uh, even closer uh, to realizing value out of the product. And that's kind of what uh, Control M looks and feels like. I know no one know, remembers what I did here, but if you got a feel for the level of effort that was involved in just, just making this happen, making uh, going through the, the various icons and menu picks uh, to accomplish something and building a workflow here with the drag and drop process. Okay. So let's see, uh, are there any, any other questions that have popped up? Uh, the only other question came from Dave, and he wants to know how is this thing sold? How do they, you know, how do they pay by the job? Or that's mm. kind of what they're asking. That's a good question, and I'll answer the best as I can. Uh, and, and we can do it two different ways right now. Actually, there's a third one we just, just introduced with, with cloud things. But uh, you can go against the maximum, the high level water uh, mark. So the maximum number of job of unique jobs that you run in a day over the previous 365 days. So if you figure that, well, we run about 1,000 jobs a day, so we may license 1,300 jobs a day, you know, to account for any any uh, uh, variability or maybe any hot spots or something. Uh, and then, you know, we'll license on the, the task count. 
And by the way, that's the way most of our customers do it, uh, which is why we have people using Control-M who run 50 jobs a day. We have people who are using Control-M that run 3 million do- jobs a day. So it's the same product, and we just price it according to the, the number of tasks that you do. In certain situations where people have massive agent machines, we can license, license it by the agent and let you run unlimited jobs based on the number of agents that you have. Uh, and when we look at agents, we actually look at the numbers of CPU sockets that are, that are on that board. Okay, So in some cases, it makes sense to, to do it licensed by the CPU, by socket. Most cases, it makes sense to do it by, by task base. Um, cloud uh, uh, is something that, that has recently started. We had to adjust the pricing there because task-based licensing makes perfect sense on the cloud, but socket-based licensing is a little trickier because that's, that cloud machine may be massive. And you don't really, if you're, you're not running a lot of jobs out there, you, you're probably overpaying. So we've introduced a new licensing concept with, frankly, I don't, I don't understand that well yet, but it, it kind of mixes the best of both. And, and the bottom line is, whichever makes the most sense for you to do, that's the one that we would, would like you to use. And it doesn't look like there's any other questions there at all. So it looks like uh, looks like that's it for today. I want to thank you for taking time out of your busy day to show this to us and explain some things for us, Joey. Thank you. Oh, my pleasure. My pleasure. And all those of you that took time out of your busy days, I know how busy IT can be. And so uh, we appreciate you taking that time out to join us. If you have any further questions at all, please give us a call at 844-FLYCAST or email us at info at flycastpartners.com. That's I-N-F-O at flycastpartners.com. We'll get an answer for you within the next five business days. With that being said, enjoy your 4th of July weekend. Until next time.